uh, last week. Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 61, The Gateway to Area Control, discussing great gateway area control and area majority games. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome anyone here in the lobby on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Today we are talking about gateway area control games as a follow-up to a question we talked about briefly during our AMA last week. Um, later on, I've got a review of Horizons from Daily Magic Games, and I'm going to be talking about a couple of RPGs in our Bellhops tabletop segment. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, or maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. So this week, I just want to highlight one conversation that's still going on on MeWe that started as a comment about our Ask Us Anything episode last week. When talking about good licensed games, I happened to mention the fastest Star Trek game as one I really liked. Ian Borshat wrote, fastest Star Trek was an excellent game. To which Emmett O'Brien, longtime fan of the show, replied, I liked character creation in Starship Combat, but there wasn't any support for making episodic stories that felt like Star Trek. Which led to Ian replying, Ah, you wanted to produce a TV show rather than live in the universe. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. On the other hand, how much support do you need for creating individual scenarios? My belief is that in a TV show, the setting exists for the screenwriter to tell a single specific story. But the setting in an RPG exists to tell all the stories. For instance, it's interesting to see a lot of the gritty background work work, first presented by FASA being integrated into subsequent official technical manuals. I felt the mechanics for creating the characters and the general visualization of the setting worked excellently, although it is at odds with many of the more modern versions of Trek ideology. However, it absolutely suited the ideology of the time of the show it emulated. But it's a matter of taste, and if you felt that it didn't give you what, what you want, find or make up a game system that does. P.S. Oh, and I don't know anyone who actually used the first edition AP-based tactical combat system, which was a bit too wargaming, which was mainly included because of the poster maps. All right. Well, Ian, uh, you do know at least one person who used the action point system in Star Trek, and that would be me and my group. Uh, while I do admit having what's basically a full miniature battle game, like a high level facing matters kind of game where you're spending points to turn 90 degrees, it didn't really fit in well with the pacing that should be in a Star Trek game. I do admit, though, I like those rules. They really reminded me of XCOM, the XCOM computer games, especially the original one in Terror from the Deep. And I actually have to wonder because... This game, the RPG, FASA, came before XCOM, and I actually wonder if the XCOM devs had possibly read or played Star Trek at some point. Oh, that's quite possible. Uh, and I have to say, I, it's, it's interesting, because I, I find in many ways uh, a lot of RPG groups do play like a TV show, uh, where you know every, every scenario is essentially an episode, not necessarily every week, uh, but every scenario would be an episode of a TV show, or a you know short, at least a at least a short uh, movie of the week sort of thing. Right. So I think what he's trying to say here is there was no description of how to make things feel like Star Trek. Mm. Instead of it's just, hey, here's a wide world universe. Right. Now, I know this conversation is still going on, and I think we may get back to it in our feedback next week. But if you go over to MeWe, you'll find my post on the AMA, and the two of them are still going back and forth. Personally, I, I'm i at this point, I'm on I. Ian's side. Like, the game rulebook gives you the world, and then it's up to you to make the scenarios in it. Oh, absolutely. Well, that's it for this week's comment. Now, thanks to everyone who shares comments and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you are here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell in an off-the-books after show. 
Already, we've had uh, Leva Moat mention that the West End D6 Star Wars was also a solid RPG system. Yeah, that's what I missed growing up. Well, actually, technically, I missed the Star Star Trek growing up as well. We only played that, what, in the last five years or so? I don't know. It might be longer now, but it, it's recent memories, not when I was a kid. But I have to agree from, from what I've seen. So the West End Games D6 Star Wars, I had picked up somewhere an introductory box set. I have a soft spot for RPG box sets. I'll, I'll pretty much buy any intro box set and try it out. And it was this D6 Star Wars intro box set where you were on a base. You basically, you were playing the hot thing, but you were in a jungle. You were in a base that was being bombarded and you had to try to get the escape pods to evacuate. And your group of characters end up being the last people stranded on the planet. And you end up having to eventually find the rebel base, they're the Imperial base and steal the ship and get off planet. And it was fantastic. It did a better job of doing Star Wars, a role-playing game at that time than anything else I'd played. Now that was before Fantasy Flight put out their system. So what I was comparing it to was the D20 Star Wars games put out by Wizards of the Coast. The D6 system blew those away. Way better, way more felt like Star Wars. I remember one of the people in my party, Jamie, was playing a Wookiee. And he did this thing where he went all arboreal through the trees and then swung on a vine off the vine into a landing speeder, throwing it into reverse, smashing into another landing speeder and getting away. I'm like, totally Star Trek. And there is no way you could have done that in the D20 system without spending 30 minutes in combat. Meanwhile, with the West End system, all he had to do was say, I'm using the force and roll a ton of D6s to pull that off, which was really cool. All right. And as usual, uh, we're going to be doing a game recommendation episode. And what we usually do during those is I am going to be looking to you folk in the chat to point out any games I've missed. And we'll be stopping back a couple times. And just let me know. Uh, I've got 10 games we're going to recommend today. If there are others that I overlooked, I would love to hear about them. All right. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. While the best way for questions to get to us is through the website, I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today, we have a question from the Tabletop Bellhop blog. Ralph asks, what's the best gateway area control game? Oh, thanks for the question, Ralph. Now, technically, we already answered this question, specifically Ralph's question, last week during our AMA. But after the show, and even partway during the show, I kept thinking of other great gateway area control games. Plus, I kept thinking in the back of my head, did Ralph actually want area control or area majority or both? So I actually thought it'd be worth returning to this question as a full topic and a full discussion. As with so many mechanics, there are subtle variations and differing uses of terms that can confuse and confound the ability to concisely answer some of these seemingly simple questions. Yeah, because Ralph asked about area control. Now, over the years, I've learned this could mean Ralph wants an area control game, exactly as he asked, or it might mean he wants an area majority game, or he might be interested in both. Now, we talked about the differences between area control and area majority way back in episode nine of the podcast, episode called Under the Hood. But I think it's worth bringing up again for those of you who haven't listened to the original. Absolutely. If you're new to the podcast, all of our back episodes are there for listening on your favorite podcatcher on YouTube, or you can go to tabletopbellhop.com and find the link to both the text and the audio as well. Now, area control game. In an area control game, you get points or a reward or something for controlling a section of the board or the map. Now, in these games, most of the time, only one player can have pieces on that thing, in that section or on that card or in that spot. Uh, and you can't have multiple people in an area. It's I have it and no one else does. Now, the most well-known area control game has got to be Risk. Everyone knows Risk growing up. You can have two different people in North America. It's one person owns it, one person controls that area. But there are many out there. Uh, there are actually a ton of war games that are area control games, but there are quite a few board games as well. Yeah. Bellhop favorites like Shogun and Wallenstein yeah. are examples that we've talked about a number of times on this show. Yeah, fantastic games that would be on this list, but they are no way gateway games. <laughs> now, on <laughs> the true. other hand, area majority games allow multiple people to have pieces in one spot, in one map section. And you're going to get points not only for having the most or most valuable things in the area, 
but you're also going to award points for second and third most or possibly fourth most, depending on the game. Uh, many games are just first, second. Some do first, second, third. It's The difference here is you have multiple forces vying for one spot at once. So you can have multiple units in an area. Now, the most pure area majority game and one that I always recommend to people who are curious about this type of game is El Grande. And uh, for a great, another great, great area majority, see if you can get your hands on Louis the Fourteenth. It's a little older, 2005, uh, but they have actually re-implemented it in uh, Zoo Mafia, which huh. is uh, a newer version. It, it's well rated, but I can't, uh, I can't say too much about it. It's still pretty new. Yeah, Louis, I played. I have not played Zoo Mafia. Louis is a nice one. I like, I like the fact you brought up Louis as an example because it's not a folk on a map game. It's it's an abstract courts politics and but it's still area majority. It's a good example, though. Again, not a gateway game. <laughs> so since Ralph here isn't particularly clear on what he's looking for, or he's exactly clear and he really wants area control, but just in case he's not, he's looking for other types of area influence games. The following game suggestions are going to include both games, both types of games, both of these mechanics. So let's start off with two games we talked about during an AMA just in case you missed last week's episode. So the first game that came to my mind when asked that question last week was an older Rio Grande game from 2002 called Clans. Now, this is a game where players are playing clans of people represented by different colored huts. You're vying for control of 12 different regions on a map. Uh, there's four different colors of each region. And each turn, players are going to move all the huts from one area to another area until an area has more than seven huts in it. And then it's uh, the city's then founded and you can't touch it anymore. At the end of the round, two colors of terrain are going to score and they score based on who has the most huts in each area. And then whoever has second most huts gets secondary scoring. Now, the neat bit in this game that makes it really cool is that no one knows which color everyone's playing. So there's some interesting bluffing going on in this game as well as area control or area majority. And just... Uh... <clears throat> Just to point out, there are a bunch of games that have the name Clans in them. Uh, yeah. Recently, Clans of Caledonia has been a uh, has, has been a, a big uh, big game with some really high numbers. But this is just Clans Clan. from two thousand and two. Um, so during our during our AMA, I pointed out this game is long out of print, but has been released with a new theme as Faye F A E from Z Man Games. Yeah, the thing with the uh, Faye, I have not played it. I, I personally haven't tried it, so I have no idea how it compares to the original game Clans. Right. Now, the other game I recommended after a bit of thinking, like I was like, Clans, there's got to be another one. So I just, it finally clicked in, and that is Small Worlds. And still, for the rest of this episode, if you are just going to pick up one area control game that's a gateway game, go with Small World. Like, that's my number one recommendation. Normally, when I give these lists of 10 games or whatever, I don't rank them. But in this case, Small World, I really do think is the best choice. Because here, players are fighting for control of a world that is simply too small to fit everyone in it. Players start by picking a race and power combination and get chits to represent their units, which are used to spread out over the map. Now, to take over a map section, all you have to do is spend more chits, more tiles than are there already. If outnumbered, though, there is a push your luck mechanic where you can roll a die. So say I only have two chits and I want to take over Sean's area that has three, I can roll the die and hopefully roll a plus two on it to be able to take it. But if you do this chance, there's a chance you'll just lose your troops. At the end of every round, you're going to get one point per area control. Really simple scoring mechanism. Things get really interesting, though, because you're going to run out of chits. You're going to run out of troops. And then you do this thing where you put your race into decline. Then next round, you start up with a whole new race and power combo and expand outward again. Yeah, and I really need to take the time to learn this. I sat down at the app on Monday. I've had it for a while. And I've just never actually really played it. And I decided to jump in blind and play without doing the tutorial. That was a horrible mistake, it turns out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, it, it's not a hard game, but if you have no idea, you're just like, I don't know, what's all these different combos and what do I do with this? I have 20 chits. What do I do with these 20 chits? Yeah, I can see. Like, you, you do need that brief explanation. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, that was Small World, and the app uh, version of it is Small World 2, because I guess the first one was not successful. Yeah, they, they've launched the app, and it was a third-party app, and the, I don't know, there was licensing, and it wasn't very good, and then they relaunched a Small World 2. And to be honest, I don't own the physical game, so it's not behind me in this pile, because we just play on our iPad. We play it on a tablet. I will admit, it's not great on the phone. It's a little small. But if you can get the app version, it is also on Steam. 
All right, up next, I've got Mission Red Planet. Now, this is specifically the second edition from Fantasy Flight Games. I did not play the original, so I don't know. I do know things changed. Uh, this is a Victorian-era rocket punk game in which you're heading to Mars to find and mine solarium. Uh, this is some ore that can be combusted and produces 10,000 times more power than steam. I'm not sure why it has the Victorian steampunk thing, but whatever. Players pick a character card out of nine different choices, like engineers, and I, I don't even know the different cards, but different character cards, you're going to play one of those. That determines where you're going to place your astronauts on a bunch of different ships that are leaving from Mars and give you a special ability. Ships once launched land on the planet, and then your people spread out to the spot they land on. Multiple times during the game, players get to mine the areas they control to score points. And again, it's it's a whoever has the most astronauts in this spot is the one that gets to do the mining. In addition, each player has a hidden goal. Uh, this is not only a great area majority game, but it's also a great gateway game or next step game. Uh, this one comes up very strongly recommended as a next step to ticket to ride. So not only are you looking at a great next step game, it's got your area control right there. Yeah, and a highly topical game right now is Mars is widely in the news between NASA and SpaceX. Uh, this today I said uh, I saw that they're looking, they're expecting that they will announce the discovery of life uh, of some form on Mars uh, by late 2021. So interesting. Yeah, I saw that Elon was sharing pictures of his rocket ship, the, the ship that's going to bring people to Mars. Supposedly. Yeah, well, that that's a whole. Yeah. I prefer the the scientists at NASA giving us actual information, <laughs> but I, you know what? I do encourage his uh, exploration of science. So there you go. We'll leave it at that. And that was Mission Red Planet. All right, something with a very different theme: World's Fair 1893. Now, this is a great example of an area majority game that is not about moving units on a map. Instead, you are playing pieces, those cubes, representing players sending supporters to various exhibits at the World's Fair. Now, this combines area majority with set collection, so players gain reputation for leading an area in the number of supporters there, as well as collecting the most midway tickets. And you also get points for the breadth and diversity of the exhibit cards you've collected through those supporters. Uh, what I really dig about this game is that all the exhibits are actual inventions and there's flavor text on each of the cards that gives you a bit of background on the different things. It's a neat way to tie the theme in with the game. Yeah, no, uh, that's a, a fun little game and it's uh, it's nice to have that little extra boost of the set collection in there as well. Always a nice thing. And to have it, uh, you know, familiar with uh, uh, other games and other aspects. Um, great. Uh, that was World's Fair 1893. All right. I don't know what it's going to be with today with games with dates in them, but that seems to be a thing. Uh, up next is New York 1901. In this game, players are building skyscrapers in downtown New York City. Skyscrapers are represented by polyominoes, uh, think Tetris, and are built into various districts on the board. They're bought via color-coded cards using a system that's going to be familiar to anyone who's played Ticket to Ride, where you're going to play the same sets of cards to put out your buildings. Uh, the area majority aspect comes down comes into play at the end of the game where players are going to get points for having the most most of their skyscrapers on each of the three raid roads. So whichever player has the most skyscrapers gets the points. What's neat here is that the corners are really powerful because that building will count for both streets. Right. So they're actually using that tool, the actual addressing of buildings and the, the funkiness that can happen in New York and others, other grid designed cities uh, as a function of the game, which is a nice little, uh, a nice little touch and uh, very thematic. So that was New York, 1901. All right, next is a Rainier Nizia classic that's been out since uh, at least 2000 or so. That is Samurai. Now, this does area control in a unique way. Players are putting numbered tiles on a hex grid attempting to surround cities. Now, these cities each contain one, two, or three different resources. Uh, there's like Buddha statues, there's high helmet troops, and rice, I think, are the three things. Once a city's surrounded, the player with the most points surrounding that city gets to take all the resources. Endgame scoring swaps the game from area control to area majority. Well, not really area majority, but a majority-based system, as players are going to then earn points for having a majority in each of the three resources. Now, while this came out way back 1998, it's still in print. You can still get it. Fantasy Flight's the new modern publisher. It doesn't look quite as good as my original version, in my opinion, but the gameplay is still just as good. Yeah, no, and it's uh, it's that right in that midweight uh, category out of two out of two five, uh, with you know half an hour to an hour play. 
Hard to go wrong. That was Samurai. All right, next is Risk Legacy. Yes, I am going to include a version of Risk on this list. A very good version of Risk, in my opinion. I was very skeptical when Risk Legacy came out, but a bunch of gamers I respect strongly recommended it, and you know what? They were right. Uh, besides being the first Legacy game and everything that grew out of that, including games like Gloomhaven we're playing every Friday, uh, Risk Legacy is a really good re-implementation of Risk. The big change is it's now victory point based. The game ends when you get four victory points and you start the game with one because you get one for controlling your home base. So you really only need to get three more points. It's no longer about having to take over the whole map. And what this means is the games are generally short. I think the longest game we played was under two hours. And most times we sat down and played Risk Legacy, we would play two games in one game night. To me, the whole legacy thing, which is really cool, is just an added bonus, an awesome added bonus. Yeah, no, uh, Risk Legacy's got a lot of love, even for people who generally hate Risk uh, <laughs> overall. I mean, Risk is Risk is one of those games that among gamers has sort of gone down into the Monopoly level of, of dislike. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, no, Risk Legacy is the, the good version. All right, here's one that, again, just kind of mixes things up, and that is Smash Up. Because this card game takes the area majority thing and makes it an abstract. Instead of battling over spots on a map, you're vying for control of location cards. Now you're doing that with forces made up by smashing together two different decks of cards. So you get, for example, alien pirates battling against wizard zombies for control of the tar pits. Uh, each deck in this in Smash Up plays completely different, and there are a ridiculous number of combinations, especially after you add in the number of expansions that continue to come out for Smash Up over the years. Yeah, this one has uh, has definitely been well expanded. Uh, I see twelve versions, but and six expansions on there. And now, uh, I guess that is that how many decks are coming out in each expansion? Like, is it? I um, to be honest, I have not caught up on it myself. Right. I think it's usually four factions per expansion, but I'm not positive. Right, but that adds up. Uh, that adds up pretty fast. Um, and that was Smash Up. All right, another game with some numbers in it. 1812, The Invasion of Canada, or your choice, 1775 Rebellion. Now, personally, I think it's uh, 1812 is the way to go because of the theme. But that's Invasion of Canada, and I live in Windsor, and my home city's on the map, right? So there's obvious reasons I, I think that's a cooler game to play. It's more interesting. But I got to say, 1775 is rated higher on Board Game Geek, so maybe the better game. Now, both of these games are cube-based, card-driven war games, uh, but don't let that scare you away. Like, a lot of people are like, oh, war game, no, that's going to take hours to play, and I got to sit and do historical research and chits and look stuff up on charts. No, that's not what this is. Uh, 1775 has often been called by many people the ticket to ride of war games because these games from Academy Games are the most accessible war games on the market. If you want a gateway version of a traditional area control war game, this is the place to start. Yeah. Now, when you say that uh, 1775 has a higher rating than, than 1812, we're talking about yeah. very, very minor, minor numbers here. Uh, it's a 7.7 seven to a 7.4. So both yeah. are well above 7, uh, and, and definitely I think it, it comes down to theme. I would not choose based on the, the rankings on BGG at that point. Yeah, my guess is that 1775 is probably just more popular by, with Americans, and that's the majority of the board game geek user base. They do have others. Like, they, there's uh, 600 and something Vikings. I haven't tried that one yet. It's in my pile of shame. They, they, there are a lot of games in this series. Just the two highest rated were these two. And like I said, 1812 is great. Plays just as good with two players up to five players. When you play five players, you play teams. Oh, okay. Really solid game system. Yeah, they actually say two and five are the best for 18 yeah. golf. Uh, to me, it's it's one or the other. You either play two player or you play with yeah. five. All right, and that was both uh, from Academy Games, 1812, Invasion of Canada, and 1775, Rebellion. All right, this is the last one I got on the list. Uh, this one I haven't played. Uh, this is Royals. I haven't personally touched this game. I know very little about it, but I, um, every time I do one of these game recommendation episodes, I do some research, right? We're not, unlike the AMA, we're not just going off the top of my head here. Um, I do go online and I try to look at other people's lists, mainly to see if there's anything I missed or forgot about. And often there'll be something I'm like, oh man, yeah, I totally forgot about whatever. And I put it on my list. Well, this time I didn't forget about anything that I noticed, but every single list, everyone's list of great gateway games includes Royals. 
great way area control game. So Royals seems to be the popular game that I have not tried. Um, I, um, players in this, in Royals, players take on the role of a great noble house in 17th century Europe and fight for control and influence in Europe. Uh, you play through three periods, and at the end of every period, points are awarded to players with the greatest influence, there's your area control, in each of the four countries. Like, that sounds good. It's got a, a BGG weight of under 2.5, so it's in the in the right area there. Yeah. No, and, uh, and do be careful, because there are two games called Royals on oh, uh, nice. out there right now, and they're both re actually reasonably recent. So, 2014 is the game we were talking about, and it looks like something that we would talk about on this this show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 2013, on the other hand, is a micro card game that no, whose box actually looks more like something you'd see in a uh, like head shop somewhere or something. I don't know. Wow. It's, okay. A, apparently, it's still thematic. It's it's still a King Regal thing, but yeah, All it's right. a different, different game. So you want Royals... From uh, Abakuspiel or who else is uh, Arcane uh, Wonders? I guess Arcane would be the Wonder, uh, yeah Arcane Wonders North American Arcane North Wonders American. Royals. Uh, and it, and I should have grabbed a link for it. There is an awesome how to play video with people all dressed up. I and I can't remember which show did it, but it was really good. I, mm -hmm. I should have grabbed a link of that. If I think of it, I'll put it in the link to the show notes. It's it's a group that did an actual play of it, and they literally all wore costumes and everything for it. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I. I looks like an interesting game but I haven't played it myself but i wanted to put it on the list because everyone else seems to think this is your go-to Though right. i gotta say um mission red planet actually came up more recommended but that was actually the oddly enough not everyone seemed to recommend small world so i think again that's that difference between area majority and area control area small world is very much area control you're not getting any points per second yep you you own an area or you don't and i thought that's more what ralph was looking for so that's why that state is my strongest recommendation all right, and that was Royals from Arcane Wonders 2014. Uh, so that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read more game, gaming, and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice. We are all about answering your questions. If you got a question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop or email us at table, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We keep growing with the support of fans like you. So if you haven't yet, please take a moment to like, subscribe, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email that recaps all the content we've released in the week previous, blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we've created. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com website where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. All right, well, join us Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch the Bellhop team do some live streaming. Yep, tomorrow I am 99% sure we are going to go back to some online gaming. Uh, probably going to be a three-player game of Terraforming Mars. Thank you, Asmodee, for having a Steam sale, and thank you, Sean, for providing Deanna with a copy of Terraforming Mars. Uh, after that, though, I have no clue. Um, we need to get the Terraforming Mars FAQ video up, which I know is partly my fault. I need to help Sean find pictures of the cards because we talked a lot about specific cards, and I think it's going to the FAQs can going to be a lot better if you can see those cards on screen while we're talking. Um, I think we'll probably hold off on doing another FAQ video until we get that up. So I don't know, maybe more gaming? Ah, quite possibly. I have actually already done the rough cut on uh, okay. that, but we are over an hour, so we do need to trim it down a little more as well Ooh, before yeah. we uh, before we go up with that, because uh, there's some there's some sort of uh, wandering at the end there that we need <laughs> yeah. to decide what we uh, what we want to keep and not keep. Because I, I I cut off some of the absolute uh, distraction at the end, but there's still <laughs> some wandering that I left in yeah. there, and we need to decide what what we're gonna keep. Because the actual FAQ was pretty quick, but then we started looking through the discussion threads on board game. Yeah, and, found, and, I, and I almost found wish some more important stuff. I know. But... I almost wish we hadn't found anything, and and we could have yeah. just cut it and keep it tight. But I, there I'm was still some... thinking we might just cut it. Yeah, there was I'm, some. I'm there was some. A little bit of a little bit of nuggets in there. So yeah, we might cut the whole thing, or maybe we'll have like we'll end the show and then some some bonus FAQ <laughs> questions or something. Right. We'll see. But yeah, I'm I'm gonna guess probably the next two Thursdays we're probably gonna do some online gaming. All right, this past weekend, we are 
the road to extra life continued. We are getting close. November 2nd is fast approaching. Uh, this past weekend at CG Realm, we had our Level Up with Extra Life charity role-playing event. And at it, we raised over $170 for Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. Yeah, thank you everyone who came out. Huge thanks to our GMs who ran games, GMs, DMs, whatever MCs, whatever name, Hollyhock Gods, whatever name you prefer to use for yourself when sitting on the side of the screen. <laughs> thank you very much. Another big thanks to Ian uh, of CG Realm for organizing the event. Thankfully, he kind of took that off mine and Deanna's hands and did everything behind the scenes and got everything going. I think things went extremely well. Now, up next, I am hosting a great Canadian board game blitz. This is going to hit on Saturday, October 12th. So hopefully all of you hear this before then, because I want to see a lot of you people out at this. This is an all-day, multi-round, no-elimination board game tournament that starts at noon on the 12th and will be held at the CG Realm at 1311 Tecumseh Road East in Windsor, Ontario. Now, the cost to enter this tournament is $10. But half of that is going right to Extra Life. That's... No, we're not taking any of that money. Half of it goes right to Extra Life, supporting Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. The other half is going to go towards prizes. And what we're doing for prizes this time, because I don't know what games you want, which games you own, is we're just going to do CG Realm store credit for first, second, and third place. Now, Jeremy, one of the owners of CG Realm, has been awesome about this and is offering to top up that amount, whatever we raise, by 20% for the prizes. We also have to plan, plan to have some door prizes to hand out, as well as prizes for first, second, and third. And for those of you curious about what games will be included in this tournament, check out the Facebook page where I published a tentative list of what games will be part of the tournament. So you got about a week and a half to get your practice games in before the big event. Up next, we've got a review of Horizons from Daily Magic Games. All right, I have been a, I would almost say fanboy of Daily Magic Games since first discovering them at Origins origins 2016 and no it's not just because they gave me purple nerds to play their games at the con after doing a demo of valeria card kingdoms at their booth uh deanna and i love the game so much we bought it outright on the spot and we don't do that uh, like that's that's like almost sight unseen right we played the game once like i gotta have this it was the first game we bought of that con first game we bought in 2016 since then, I've pretty much kept up with all the Valeria games. Uh, I've got all the Card Kingdom expansions, as well as all the offshoot games, Quests of Valeria, Villages of Valeria, and so on. Um, I also picked up Chocolatiers, that's more recently, and we are yet to be disappointed with all these games. And when I first saw Horizons, and I gotta admit, I didn't see any buzz on this one. I, I, from what I understand, it was Kickstarted, but I, I missed that. There's a lot of Kickstarter games. When I first saw it, I just thought it was gonna be a sci-fi retheme of Valeria. Whether or not necessarily exactly a Card Kingdom's knockoff, it was going to be like it. I was expecting a card-based tableau builder where I'm looking at hands of cards and playing cards in front of me, building a tableau. And wow, was I surprised to learn that it is not at all, like not even close. Like I was totally at the wrong mechanics, wrong ballpark. While there are cards in the game, and I could say it's somewhat card-driven, Horizons is much more of an action selection area control board game. Yeah, no, uh, I've been looking forward to playing this, and I hope uh, that it's definitely going to be on the list for next time we're down, I think. Now, this is a sci-fi themed board game for two to five players, designed by Live Moat, featuring art by Mihailo Dimitrevsky, otherwise known as Miko. I love Miko's art, so I'm a huge fan of his art. He did all the art for Valeria, he did the art for um, Raiders of the North Sea as well. So, love the art, the art's amazing. Most of the games I played on the Horizons have been about an hour, with a couple being really short which I'll get to in a minute. Now, in Horizons, each player is going to play, take on the role of a spacefaring race, just starting their expansion out into the galaxy. Galaxies composed of a number of stars equal to the number of players. At the start of the game, each player is going to add one planet, drawn randomly, to the stars. Then the race picks one planet type that's already in play to be adapted to out of the six types, and you get one alien ally card to start, and that card is the same for all the players. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's a... Uh... Simple box, uh, simple box. That's one of the nice things about this uh, company is yeah. none of their games are way overblown. They're good, solid games with a lot of, of potential and capability, but it's not crowded with too many different bits and bobs and, and things to do things. So it lays out nicely on the table. Yeah, you're, it's it's definitely not overproduced, but well produced. Mm -hmm. uh, wooden components, nice thick cardboard. Nice box insert, but it's not perfect. Parts tend to fall out, especially the little ad adaptation counters, but it's still better than an empty box, in my opinion. 
Now, once players start sit down to actually play the game and you're starting Galaxy's Row, it becomes an action selection game where you're going to build buildings to collect resources in order to expand your control over the stars. Excuse me. Points are awarded for exploration, for holding majority and minority control. So this gets that area majority system that we were talking about earlier. And for completing gold cards and through knowledge points gained through the use of those alien ally cards. No. Sorry. Now, each round, players are going to select two actions. They include explore, draw and play a world tile. They're drawn from a bag. They're two-sided. There's six different types of worlds. Uh, each world has a different cost for building stuff on it later. Some worlds can only host certain types of buildings as well. You also get a knowledge point for exploring. So I thought this was neat because it encourages people to explore just to get some victory points. Because otherwise, explore is not the hugest, the biggest action. You don't get a lot of stuff for doing it. Up next is adapt. That's learning to live on a different world. Once you've adapted to a planet, you can then build on it. At the same time, you are going to get an ally card. Now, these are a big part of the game. Ally cards represent alien species that assist you with the various actions. There's five piles of actions, one for each of the different, or sorry, allies, five piles of aliens, allies, for each of the different, one for each of the different actions. So five different actions, five different allies. And the way it works is after you complete an action, you can then use an ally of the appropriate type to gain some kind of bonus. The allies you have can each be used twice, but then they're returned to the bottom of their decks. So use Adapt to live on a new planet and to get allies. Building lets you build energy collectors, steel collectors, or colonies. Uh, those are the two main resources of the game, energy and steel. Collectors obviously produce those. Colonies are worth points at the end of the game for sector control. Whenever a player builds their sixth colony, the game ends. Also, when you build a building on a planet where someone else has already built, each player gets one resource of their choice. So this, the game encourages you to um, group together, right? So you're competing over areas instead of everyone sticking their own part of the board. Uh, harvest is really simple. Collect resources for your building. You get one resource for each collector you built using the build action. Conspire. Draw two mission cards or one ally and one mission card. Now, mission cards are hidden goals that score at the end of the game. And man, do they vary. They are all over the place. Uh, play certain buildings, have buildings on different planet types, have the certain things in the solar system, have different sets of allies. It's a crazy, huge deck with a lot of different combinations. Now, after you've finished completing your actions, the, the game doesn't end. You then have a bunch of limits you have to check. You're only allowed to hold 10 of each resource, five mission cards, and so on. No, uh, so this is basically uh, a 4X game that you can play in about an hour. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't call it, I'd say it's a 3x. Yeah, uh, there, it's, it's there missing, you're no, not really, you don't have the combat. Uh... Yeah, they're, they're, you're definitely exploiting systems, you're definitely expanding, you're definitely exploring, but there's no um, extermination. There is right. no direct player versus player interaction. Uh, the only thing you have is you might take a spot the opponent wants. That's about right. it. Or an ally card they want. So now I did note the game ends one player plays their final colony. So once that happens, you get victory points for area control of the star system the mission cards you've got, and you count those knowledge tokens, players with the most points wins. Now, each player board in the game is two-sided. Now, the actions I just described are the human sides of the board, which are symmetrical. Every person plays the same. The opposite sides have an alien side, which makes the game asymmetrical. Now, what they've done here is one or more of those basic actions will be changed. They've been changed significantly. Like, there is a race that starts the game adapted to three planets, but can't ever take the adapt action or adapt or land on the other three planets. There's another race that can never conspire. So they can never get gold cards for using the conspire action, but instead get mission cards whenever they adapt to new planets because they put out ambassadors. There's even a race that can build colonies on the stars instead of the planets. Yeah, it's interesting. There's uh, there's some chat I'm seeing that's saying you shouldn't play it without the, uh, the newest expansion or the only huh. expansion for it. Uh, because it adds some balance, it, it solves some balance issues okay. uh, in the game, but uh, it, that, that could be a, a heavy player who's just sort of you know played it until they found all the uh, the little cracks that may exist in a game. That when when you've got this many moving pieces, this many yeah. uh, you know this many interactions between races and cards and card types, and this level of asymmetry, it would almost be hard to imagine not having some cracks that are going to appear in the uh, yeah in the system. It's the expansion must have just come out. Yeah, it's a like 2019. It's a 2019. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking it's probably like October, September 2019, because I've never even seen an expansion uh, for this. Possibly. So it might be late in the year. Uh, Horizons Extermination is the... Okay. Uh, yeah, so obviously I haven't tried that yet. No, so no, this obviously. is just on the base game. <laughs> um, so, as I mentioned, while you're using cards for your goals and you're using cards for your aliens, it's not really a card-driven game. Like, the cards are going to give you some nice bonus actions, 
But this game is an action selection resource management area majority game. It's very much a uh, Euro style of area majority where you can't really influence other players' actions. I wouldn't go so far as to call it multiplayer solitaire, but it's getting towards that issue. You just try to build somewhere before someone else does or you take an ally they may want. That's pretty much all you can do to actually like influence your opponent's play. Uh, yes, and, and Love Mode is saying expansion adds the fourth X. It, it's extermination yeah. is what it oh, is. Oh, there you so, go. Well, it makes sense. Yeah, it's called extermination. Perfectly so, makes sense. Uh, looks like it's up for pre-order on DM, on Daily Magic. Yeah, so I don't, that means it's probably uh, not even out yet. Or, or well, actually, possibly not. That may have been a bad link. So, yeah. Um, yeah. We'll see. So, overall, my thoughts on uh, Horizon. So, I got to say it's a solid board game. Um, I dig act selection games uh, like Race for the Galaxy, Puerto Rico. Um, and this game does action selection well. Now, this isn't like Eminent Domain or Race where everyone gets to follow and do what you pick. What you do only affects you. So again, it's very Euro-like that way. There's not a lot of player in interaction. What is unique to Horizons, though, and is really cool, is the way you get the allies to assist you with the actions. And having different aliens of each of the basic actions, and then a number of each of these aliens so that each deck's different with a bunch of different potential effects is really the highlight of this game. It's using these ally cards effectively that's key to winning a game of Horizons. Right. And uh, I did just find it. So it is up for sale on uh, the Daily Magic games. And it's just, it's a small little uh, little deck, sort of like when they expand their Valeria decks. Okay, um, so it's, it's, a 15, it's a little $15. It's a little bigger okay. than the expansion, but it's it's still just uh, a few extra cards to uh, to get in there. Fair enough. Yeah. Now, what I was really surprised, besides the fact that it's a totally different game than I thought it was going to be, is how quick it is. Like you mentioned, it's under an hour, right? I would almost say, though, that this game can be too quick because uh, the game ends immediately when someone blails their sixth colony. And I found it can end what I would call prematurely because if a player just focuses on building those. So this is, maybe it's an outlier, but this is an example. We had one game that ended in under 15 minutes because a player started the game with a goal card that said, you get 10 points if you all you build is colonies. You never build any of the other buildings. So that's what he did. He built an engine, built six colonies as quickly as possible. Not even half the star systems were full of planets. And yet the game was over. Now I got to admit, Mike was the one playing. He was pretty happy with himself, but for the rest of us, it wasn't a very rewarding experience at all. Now, how often is something like that going to become be possible? Like, is that is 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 someone going to be able to pull up that combo and burn through quickly, or is that sort of a an outlier? And most of the time, you're going to get a little bit more of a complete game for all those playing. I, the odds of drawing that card as your starting hand are obviously ra rather small. Like, the, it's, a, it's a significant deck. I don't know. You could probably find somewhere online that lists how many cards are in the quest deck. Playing with all five players, we had the full deck, so it's a, it's a solid deck. Uh, but the thing is, the fact that we know that card's there, there are ways you could purposely aim for that strategy now. Now that the five of us who played could be like, huh, I could just keep taking the... Um, I already forget conspire action to keep getting more cards until I find that and purposely not build anything. But that might waste a lot of time. I, I think it was an outlier, but it was a bad one. Like that was a like if that had been my first experience with colonies, we might not even have this review because I might have been a one and done. Like it was that bad. Interesting. Uh Lev Moat in the chat room is mentioning that it's definitely an outlier in that generally building colonies is very difficult uh without collectors. So Yeah. Okay. See, in that case, he was playing a character that had to use victory points to build. Because right. we were using the asymmetric side of the board, which actually gets me to my next point. Because the other thing I didn't expect is I like the human side better, which is weird for me. Because normally I love asymmetry in games, and we talk about that often. But in Horizon, the area alien boards didn't feel interesting. They Rather, they felt limiting. Uh, rather than having some cool new thing I could do because I was an alien, there were basic actions that I felt were needed to be able to play well that I just couldn't do anymore. And instead, I had to go through a weird workaround to get done the same thing I wanted wanted to do on my human side of the board. And I just found they were punishing and not fun. Like in this case, I think the asymmetry is too extreme and it changed the races too much. And I do, like you mentioned it earlier, I did see online when doing some research that some people do seem to think there are broken combos with the, the, the asymmetry with some of the races that some are more powerful than other ones. Right. Uh, and it's, it sounds like I'm, from what I'm hearing and, and from what I read, it's sort of, it's one of those things where it, if you've got that right, the, the cards and 
the the races become a problem. So if the car if the deal if the deal works out nicely, everything's gonna be fine. But uh Oh, well, interestingly, Leva Mode is telling us that something slipped by them in production. So uh apparently we've got a fan in the uh <laughs> yeah. you know, from the company in the chat room right now. So uh, we'll have to check, you'll have to check the, the FAQ for this one. And maybe we have oh, so our there, next there are two of the boards. So we play with all five boards. So two of the five players were playing with boards that have a mistake on them. Interesting to know. Cause I gotta say, like, it, wait, I did not enjoy it. I, I, the game, I did not enjoy the asymmetry. It was neat to see how everyone was so different. Cause they are, they are very different. And that was neat to see. Um, I'm going to have to give that another look then with the errata. That, that's frustrating. So overall, um, again, with the caveat that we obviously haven't played with the full errata in play, is I got to say it's solid. It's a, it's a really solid game. There's a lot here to like. I uh, love the artwork, love the the components, love Miko's artwork. Box inserts, good, except the, the little things kind of fall out now and then. But you keep it flat, it's good. The rule book's clear. Um, you can actually see we've got an unboxing video. If you head up to head over to our um, YouTube channel, you can see the unboxing video and check it out yourself. Um, game's fun. The mechanics are solid, and I do really like the ally system. And while I'm not a huge fan of the asymmetric aliens, everything works. It works well enough. At its core, it's a good game. The problem is, it's just that. It's just, it's it's a good game. It's fun. It's a good way to pass the time. It's nothing more. Uh, it's not one of those games where I go to bed thinking about it, and I'm like, oh, man, I need to uh, I need to try this next time I play. Uh, I, the way it feels is I don't feel like I'm going to be talking about that epic game of Horizons we had about a month ago. It's just not overly memorable, right? Like, it's good. It's a really good game. It's a solid game. It's well designed. You can tell it's well played tested. It's just not great. It just, there's nothing here that feels overly new or refreshing. Right. It works. It works well. It just doesn't wow me. Well, I think it's interesting. And I, and I think this is, this is one of those things where, we're getting it again. We've gotten into a problem that we've talked about before on the show where it, it's almost that one and done. Because to me, this sounds like a really great game, a four X game. Once you add in the expansion well, and you add in that fourth 3. X, 5. um, a 3.5 X or that, that, that can be expanded to a four X. Um, and you can actually buy the, the whole thing in, in, uh, as one, uh, the Kickstarter came with both, I guess. Oh, that's cool. Yep, so yep. you, you can buy the whole horizons with the whole four X version for 60 bucks off their website. Uh, and you play a 4X game in 60 minutes. I mean, that's yep. that's something you don't really get. Um, and so if, you know, someone like me who's, you know, got the family and we don't have a, a full-out gaming table that we can go to, and I, I wanted to play something that sort of full, but right. do it quickly, I think that's a really great place to be. I think one of the problems is that as, you know, hobby gamers, we're always looking for that experience. Mm -hmm. um, whereas this is a solid game. And it's meant to be a solid game, not necessarily that experience that I think we're all a lot of a lot of the time, you know, hoping for and searching for, especially when we think of four X games. Yeah, you know, it's, it's not it's, Twilight it's, Imperium. It's, it's not that epic, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's yeah. not Twilight Imperium. Like I said the, the the way the races, the aliens work. The alien allies is a really neat system, and I don't know. I just feel like it needs to be part of something bigger. Uh, the asymmetric races, I I don't know. I usually I love asymmetry. I'm going to have to check out, like I said, the, the fact that there's an errata for it. That, that That's unfortunate that that slipped by the production and got out there because I wonder if it, that'll improve on it. So I'm going to have to give the game another chance, at least if, uh, at least trying with those optional rules or the errata, sorry, the errata applied. See if that makes a difference. But like I said, it's a solid game. There, there's nothing, I can't complain about Horizons in any way. It, it's one of the better games I've played this year. It just, it doesn't have that wow factor. It doesn't have that je ne sais quoi, right? Like, just doesn't quite get there that I'm like, oh, let's go play Horizons. I just don't quite get that from it. And... Right. Well, I'm definitely, uh, the first errata I've found is uh, on the Dredge, D-R-E-J. Uh, it's uh, tap, build a collector, gain one energy for each energy collector, or gain one metal for each metal collector. Uh, and I guess yeah, the I or seems like it's the... Uh, to be honest, I don't remember offhand. Uh, and I, I'm not seeing the other errata in there, but I'm sure I can find it uh, when we're not when we're not chatting. Um, no, and I mean again, I am I'm a huge fan of the the Valeria games, uh, and and I think that that makes me interested in playing this. And again, mm -hmm. most of the time, because a lot of times you know when I am down and we we don't have enough time, uh, 
we don't ever play a 4x game because no, there's never long. time for a 4x game mm-hmm. so to be able to play something like that in a shorter amount of time definitely has uh a an interest to me i will say like uh not that i'm great on putting down other games but compared to say masters of ryan the card game which is another 4x style game that you played in about four hours or sorry about four hours in about an hour that came out wrong i gotta say i like this better like, uh, uh, this was better than the Master Ryan card game. It was a better use of the allies and stuff like that. It was a neater experience. Right. And yes, So now so- we just need Daily Magic Games to send me a copy of the expansion so I can do a review of it and explain to everyone how it gets better with the review, with the, well, with the expansion. Well, uh, apparently, apparently, uh, <laughs> Levi in the uh, chat room is uh, Levi Moat. Uh, and a Species 1825 Transfigure Action is... Uh, uh, apparently incorrect as printed. It should be transfigure, gain one knowledge, play, uh, draw and play a world, activate that world, or take an ally is the uh, the correct. All right. So, all right. Uh, we have jumped all over the place now, so I'm not sure where you want to, uh, to jump I, I, in. I have, I have highlighted <laughs> uh, here. Yep, there we are. So that was our review uh, review of Horizons from Daily Magic Games. Have you played Horizons? What did you think? Uh, let us know through social media or email at mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Now you can find this review and more like it over on our blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Uh... And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. All right. Besides a couple of five-player games of Horizons, which I think you've all just heard enough about, uh, the big thing that happened this past week was our Level Up with Extra Life event at the CG Realm. Another one of our Road to Extra Life 2019 gaming events leading up to the big game day on November 2nd and 3rd. Now, at this event, we had local gamers running RPGs in four-hour time slots. We had one slot running from noon to 4 p.m. and another running from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. And in the middle, we hosted an RPG book exchange, which also raised some money and got me some new stuff, including an unpunched copy of Silent Death, an old classic sci-fi war game. All right. Well, this was the third of our Extra Life event so far this year, and one step closer to our goals, as we were discussing earlier in the announcements. Yeah, we did pretty good. Um, originally, I had planned to run some games myself. That was the uh, the original idea, but the organizer, uh, again, Ian, gave much out earlier, suggested that I sit back this year, relax, and actually play. Uh, that, combined with the fact that, I gotta admit, we didn't have a lot of signups online, so I was worried we were going to have DMs without players. So I decided to sit on the other side of the screen this year, and I'm glad I did. Uh, For the noon session, I joined a game of Paranoia, ran by Randy McCall. Now, I've never actually played Paranoia before, though I did run the second edition of the game many, many years ago. The computer is your friend. (laughs) Are you happy, citizen? Please report for termination. Uh, The game Randy ran was an interesting mashup of the latest Paranoia edition, which came out uh, the last couple of years. It's called the Paranoia Red Box Clearance Edition. Or sorry, Paranoia Red Clearance Edition, and it's a box set. Um, And he kind of mashed that with the classic game I remember. Now, the reason for this is uh, the way Randy explained is the new edition has significantly changed from what I grew up on. A major part of this change is swapping to a card-driven action system for all combat. Now, Randy noted that that made the game feel like a board game using that system, and he preferred more roleplay-based style of play. Now, personally, without having tried the new system, it did sound somewhat limiting, so I was happy to play by Randy's house rules. Uh, We did use a bunch of the cards from the box set from the new system, and I did like what I saw of those. Uh, For example, we had cards for our roles in our teams. I was the happiness officer. Uh, We had a card for our secret society. Um, Oddly enough, I didn't belong to one, but it strongly encouraged me to talk to the other troubleshooters to see if I could get into theirs. Um, Our mutant powers were also on cards. Mine was Anomaly. And the most fun one was the equipment cards. We were each handed out a hand of four equipment cards that were assigned to us at the start of our mission that were specifically chosen by the computer and would obviously be vital to mission completion. All right. Well, you know what? 
it's it's such a such a throwback. We had a lot of really great weekends playing uh, Paranoia back in the day, and uh, it, it's crazy. But yeah, I, I had never realized until I was reading the show notes for tonight that no, you'd never played this nope. game. Never played all the times we've gone in and and played and played and played, and you always DM. Them. Yep. I was a true for almost everything back in the day. I was the DM. I was the one that owned the books. I ran all the games. So one of the major changes in the new edition of Paranoia, besides this card-driven system, we didn't really get to see is they tossed out the D20, which, man, that took some adjusting to. Uh, this is now a D6 dice pool system that reminded me the most of Tales from the Loop. Uh, except in this, you're not just looking for sixes, you're looking for fives or sixes. Which is, and, and I get how that's jarring, but uh, well, I find what a, what a system does with its rolling mis mechanic is more important than which rolling mechanic they it is they use you know uh, we were always so in love with the percentile from warhammer fantasy role play but that was really just kind of familiarity yeah. more than anything else you can you can get the you can achieve the same thing in a lot of different methods yeah very true yeah it's just uh, the, the mechanic the actual dice mechanic is probably one of the smaller things you can change in a game to have impact. Now, the one thing that hasn't changed is uh, the feel, right? Uh, just how over-the-top, silly, post-apocalyptic, dystopian setting with the, the friend computer and always having to be happy in your bouncy bubble beverage and your insane robots and everyone wanting to hunt out traitors who are members of secret societies and mutants while every player is a member of a secret society and a mutant, right? That hasn't changed. It, it's the same craziness. Um... I've always been a huge fan of Alpha Complex and Friend Computer and the insanity that ensues in this setting. Randy's game did not disappoint that way. Our game had us starting off as newly recruited level red level troubleshooters sent to Sector Hall Y Wood, uh, battling our clones against classic sci-fi creations, including Robbie the Robot, the Thunderbirds, and Dr. Satan. All right. Now, if I'm correct, they have actually eliminated the references to communists that used to be littered yes. throughout the game because we're no longer we're no longer Cold War era. So, though it seems like we may be heading back there, I think they could put well. communists <laughs> back in the 2019 edition and it would work. But yeah, um, Randy kind of glossed that over because I asked him that question. Uh, I think they just called them terrorists, which to me just for, I don't know maybe it's because I grew up in the 80s seems worse, where commie sounds seems funny and terrorist seems frightening. I, I I'm thinking that's probably just my age showing, but yeah, he just we just called them traitors. Right, we were looking for mutant traders and secret side traders and traders to the computer. Right. Uh, overall, I love the cards. I gotta admit, I've, I've always been a fan. Right, I liked Warhammer Third Edition, despite many people not liking it. Um, I like having stuff in front of me, so I don't have to look up stuff in rule books. So it worked really well for the random equipment. That part was awesome. Um, the new dice system seemed solid enough. Uh, there was something neat Randy was doing behind the screen, where he had red dice and one of the sides was a computer logo. Uh, I meant to ask him about that, but when the game ended, we had other stuff going on, so I totally forgot to ask. Uh, the game was fun, though none of us lost a single clone, so I guess that part wasn't very paranoia-like compared to the games I ran as a kid, though. Uh, mostly, I, it was fun, but I'm really curious about this new card-driven combat system and this new almost board gamey version of Paranoia. Um, I... If I didn't have like a pile of stuff that I already need to review and play, I'd be really tempted to go pick up this new edition. Yeah, it's to me, it's it's interesting about that game because to me, the reason you have clones is because you're going to lose yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, and and I'm wondering if that's an an oversight or babying the players. Uh, for me, uh, my instinct, if I were to be running a paranoia game, would be to lean more towards a TPK. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know. No, leave that as a risk or, you know, one, one, one uh, citizen, you know, get it, I mean, blessed by the computer yeah. and making it through. Uh, that seems more them thematically on point than no, nobody agree. losing. A, I mean, just, I mean, there were, there were games where we, the first 10 minutes we were down yes. on our third clone. Yeah. Uh, admittedly, yeah, it, we got a little crazy and that's excessive, but. Yeah, we our group very worked really well together, which is odd for Paranoia, right? Plus, it was a charity event where if, if I were Randy, I would have been pushing even more and trying to get people to donate, right? Because oh, yeah. we allowed for cheating. So I donated a buck so I could be the happiness officer. I also cheated to get a certain piece of R&D. But, like, I fully expected to have to buy a seventh clone, and the game just mm -hmm. didn't go there. Interesting. 
Now, the other game I played at our Level Up event was a game of Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Now, at this point, I still haven't read D&D 5e. Um, I did play in one convention game at Queen City Conquest, but that game was rather unique. Uh, thanks, Andy. And not very traditional D&D game. That was something else. That was a little weird there. Yeah, it's right. The former D&D licensed DM has never actually played D&D yeah. 5th Ed. Though, depending on who you are, you may be gasping or cheering. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There's going to be people who are happy I haven't actually sat down and learned 5th edition. There's going to be people who are probably like, what the heck? Yeah, I had that the, the DM running this game. He's like, come play D&D. And I'm like, I don't know how to play D&D. I'm like, well, I know how to play D&D, <laughs> but I don't know how to play 5th edition D&D. And you're like, ah, uh, there's, uh, there's no way that's true. And I'm like, no, I, I have the books. I haven't sat down. I don't even have all the books. I bought the starter set and I haven't even opened it. But anyway, uh, it's D&D. All D&D is still D&D, right? It's, it's like riding a bike. Uh, the game I played Saturday was a very traditional D&D experience. Uh, we had a party of four adventurers. We were hired to scope out an inverse pyramid in the middle of a desert. Uh, there was a scholarly society that wanted to get in there and archive and document and check out everything and be archaeologists. But they wanted to make sure there was it was safe first, so they sent a group in. And of course, the group that was sent in never returned, so our group was the backup plan. Well, a dungeon crawl concept at its finest. I mean, that's kind of what D and D was meant to be. Yeah. Get in there and clean out that dungeon, you dirty yep. rotten. That's, that's exactly what it was. Uh, this game was mostly exploration and discovery, which was neat. Uh, there were a couple of combats, like only two main combats, and they were very trap filled. That made it interesting. It wasn't just walk up and hit with a sword. Uh, and then the game ended in a puzzle. Now the game was very well run. I had a pretty good time planning it, despite having to try to figure out a seventh level character without any real D&D 5e experience. Uh, but I was smart enough to choose a fighter. And I got to say, seventh level fighters aren't really all that complicated. It was pretty straightforward. All this weird stuff where you get to spend these expertise dice to do things. It's kind of neat. Uh, the game went well, I got to say, except until the final scene, which ended in a direct puzzle, like a you have to figure out the order to do the things and do them the right way or else bad things happen. It's, it's interesting. I haven't played D&D &D since Skills and Powers. Uh, yeah. And I'd be interested to get my get a, a fifth ed character sheet and see if I would actually be able to sit down and play that character without tearing my hair out or asking a million questions, referring, you know, Googling yeah. madly before I could actually feel confident to sit down. It, it's interesting to see just how much that base mechanic of, you know, this is your character and you should be able to know enough about them from the character sheet. Yeah, uh, to to get going, I I think you'd have a hard time just because you never did third or three point five or four because second edition still used Thaco, right? It was right. a d twenty system. You you had a bunch of different saving throws like versus rod, staff, and wand. It really changed up at third edition, and then right. three point five four of all kind of evolved. If you would play three point five, you'd be fine. Right. Jump from second to fifth is is big in a way, except for the style of play, because the one thing fifth brought back is it's much more open. It's much more relying on DM fiat and DM interpretation, which was a big part of second edition. So it plays more like second edition, but mechanically, there's a significant change there. Now, thankfully, I have played a lot of three. I ran a campaign up to 13th level in 3.5. I ran over 200 games of fourth edition, so I'm no stranger to the D20 system that right. it's still based on. Right. That's fair. Which it's not a huge change. It's 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 all you add. You, your stats don't matter. All that matters is the bonus they give you, and then you get a bonus and skills. I don't know how these bonuses are worked out in fifth edition, but they're on your sheet, right? right? So it's you look and it says roll intimidate. You look under intimidate. It says plus six. You roll a d twenty. You add six, right? Like it's not hard, right? Uh. The big thing with this game that I do want to talk a bit about, now Sean may have some things to say on this too, because I'm not sure your feelings on this, is puzzles. Puzzles in any role-playing game. Because the problem I have with puzzles in any role-playing game is that they remove the role-playing. You're no longer role-playing once you're playing a puzzle. Once a puzzle's presented, you're now relaying on player skill and player ability and tossing out everything on that character sheet. It doesn't matter who my character is. Unless I do something silly like, well, my intelligence is only eight, so I'm not going to help solve the puzzle with the rest of the group. Like, there's really no way to tie it in. And yeah, we had the make a history check for a hint thing happen, but really it was up to us to solve the puzzle. And we failed. We never did figure out the puzzle at the end of this game. Well, you know, it's unfortunate, but it's something like an escape room in that way. Yeah. Um, and I think it's it's... A lot of it depends on how that puzzle is crafted. 
Um, no, if you've got a straight brain burner, uh, and you've got, you know, a, a wizard and a priest and a fighter, uh, your fighter probably, unless he's got a, you know, high intelligence should probably be trying to figure out how to solve it with his sword. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's definitely that issue, but you know, sometimes when you play an escape room, you get walked out by the supervisor at the end. Um, yeah. and, and I think, I think if, if it's set up that way where no, you lost, but you know, you're still getting paid by the secret society because yep. they can go into the, the dungeon now that it's safe and they're smart enough and they know all the clues already to solve this. They just wanted you to get clear the path there. Yeah. Um, no, you don't go, get that extra bonus of feeling super special that you did the, <laughs> the thing you weren't supposed to be able to do, but you did everything you needed to do. Um, yeah, I can see that because like in ours we ran out of time, right? That's that's part of what happened. Uh, it, these were four-hour time slots with 15 minutes left in the time slot. We were stumped. Um, we had one party party member down who may have actually solved the puzzle, but as far as we were concerned, they were done. They they were te- they were dead. Right. Though they were running a little separate thing. We called it a night. And uh, with the party down, we decided in game it made the most sense to do exactly what you said. Is well, we cleared the dungeon out. Let's leave and let the archaeologist solve it. Um. We did our part, right? Uh, it worked. Like, it, it was, it just, it wasn't a very rewarding, satisfying ending, especially for a one shot, right? Like, I'm in a one shot and I kind of want that big. Well, you know, we have, we have end. talked about, you know, in, in previous episodes, how if you're doing a one shot in particularly, this should be the best day of your characters' yes. lives. Exactly. Um, and while this sounded like a darn successful event, uh, that's not the best day in your character's life. Yeah, so, that wasn't that wasn't the most memorable. I don't even remember my character's name, so that's a bad sign. That that seventh level fighter just went on to do his next thing. He didn't do anything cool. Right. I don't know. It was it was all right. It was like the rest of the game was great. I actually, like I said, in particular, I like the combats. The tactical combats with the traps were very well done. I like the puzzle aspects. Um, the DM's descriptions of the rooms and the evocative setting, like it was very much an exploration game. Like we were discovering this pyramid, which was really cool. Um, as an afterthought, uh, talk about linear. My God, it was all just one room after another, but so what it worked right for what we were doing. It's a con game. I don't need to be able to explore a bunch of empty rooms, right. And yep. find all the right ways and find the secret doors. It was very much a straightforward dungeon, but that's fine. It worked. And like I said, the, the descriptions, of the rooms, the setting that was set, there was obviously a history to this place. Oh, that was great. Like uh, you talk about the pillars of D&D, exploration being one of them. That was very solid in this. And combat was also very solid. Just that puzzle, I, I personally wouldn't, if I had put the puzzle in, there would have been more things we could have rolled dice to solve it for. We could have, I would have made it more like a fourth edition skill challenge. But then I ran 200 games of fourth edition. So <laughs> it's just the way I think about D&D. Right. Um, so far though, like fifth ed seems good. Um, this was no exception. I'm glad I played. Um, I would sign up, to play D and D again, as long as I'm with a group that's willing to let me be the noob who they now and then have to say, Hey, you have this ability. You might want to use it. Cause that did come up a couple times. I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm so, like, I'm a fighter. What do I do? <laughs> I just go hit it. And they're like, Oh no, no, you get to hit it twice. Read this. Oh, cool. I get to hit it twice. Oh, and then you could do this to hit it a third time. I'm like, Oh, okay. So now we know you don't have time and uh, <laughs> there's, there's not much RPG going on in any of our uh, mm. lives lately, but having played it once at least and gotten a little bit of experience and seen some of the difference between four and five, would you, had you had the ability to run fifth ed or would you, are you still uh, a lover of fourth? Uh, no, I would, I would happily run fifth if I wanted to run D and D, but I have no, in- I don't want to run D. I want to run shadows of the demon Lord, or I want to yeah. run runaway hirelings, or I want to run dungeon crawl classics. No, absolutely. I've just, D&D there's so much D&D, out there. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, there's just D and D's D and D. Now I'll admit my group, my Monday night group would love it. If I just went and I'll run D and D and we'll play fifth ed and it's familiar. I don't know. I, I personally would rather broaden my realm to something else. There's, there's so many other games out there. I want something more focused too. Like D and is just so it's, it's generic high fantasy, right? Whereas if I do shadows of the demon Lord, that's got that Warhammer grim, dark striving against the darkness. That's what I like in my games. That's what I like to run. I'd much rather do that for a D and D style game or do something totally different. Like run hydro hacker operatives where we're playing hydro punk Robin hoods, trying to steal water from the corporation. Right. See Deanna saying she wants to play. She wants to play D and D second edition skills and powers though, which I, I don't expect to run anytime <laughs> soon. See, and I'd be happy to get in on a D&D second <laughs> skills and power yeah. edition. Um, dial me in. Um, all right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? 
All right. Well, this weekend is uh, Jeff Seuss, patron of the show's wedding. So we are going to go to Jeff's wedding. Uh, well, I'll go to your wedding, too, if you know. No, this isn't a patron <laughs> award. Jeff's a friend. He's a longtime friend. Um, we are going to Jeff's wedding. Um, he's going to have games there because, you know, he listened to our episode about having games at weddings and was like, damn, that's a good idea. Um, I'm personally going to be bringing Goku and Azul for people to play. So I expect to play some games at a wedding reception. Well, congratulations to Jeff and Sheila. Uh, best wishes. We've seen the game pile in our discord, yep. uh, for, for, uh, patrons, uh, and, and been involved in that discussion along the way. And then the week after that's the board game blitz. So I, it'll be a bad week for me talking about what I play. Cause I don't think I'll be playing anything, but for <laughs> those of you who are local, come on out October 12th. This will be a big one. This is always a fun event. Five rounds, no elimination. You're going to get to play five different games and possibly win some CD Realm gift cards and support a good cause. All right. Well, we're taking a little step back into the lobby here. We've had a little bit of chat. Brian's joined us. Thank you for uh, popping in, Brian. And uh, a lot of chat about uh, a lot of chat about D and D because well, yeah. the people are loving D and D. Uh, Brian had a great comment. Uh, playing D and D is like riding a bike. With one advantage, riding two bikes and taking the better one. Uh, <laughs> um, me riding a bike nowadays would be with disadvantage, I think. That's, that's, that's what would happen to me. I do have to thank Levi for joining us in the chat. Um, my bad for not recognizing the name right away. Levi Moat is actually the designer of Horizons. Um, I hope I wasn't too brutally honest. I wasn't going to change my opinion because the designer was in the chat room. Uh, so I said it as it is. Um, I will send you that DM you requested later. I don't know if you're still around, if you, if you left bad. after we were done your section or not, but thank you for joining us. Uh, he hung around long enough to mention that he loves uh, Silent Death. Oh, see, uh, that's but a I, classic. Yeah, but, I, but I think he popped out shortly after that. Uh, yeah, understandable. Fair. That's uh, again, fair. You know, absolutely appreciate them joining in. Uh, D&D is uh, sorry, D's agreeing that, uh, yeah, not dying in paranoia is just weird yeah it's weird uh scott played with me too and and i i played with people i don't always play with right uh, holly was there and we played very conservative but not in a safe conservative but in a, like we weren't trying to screw each other over and i kind of did it a bit with scott but i don't know holly well enough right. and this one of the things we did not see at extra life was a lot of safety tools so i didn't know how holly would react to betrayal and that's a game where there is betrayal but i don't know the other player who's at the right. table so i might do i want to stab this person i don't know in the back in front of their face right because that's kind of what paranoia is about so oh, absolutely yeah it, it's interesting there, there were tables that did have a uh, have an x card and there were a couple discussions about safety tools but it wasn't like when we go to breakout or when we go to the other cons and it's something that's present at every table so in my opinion that's something that we need to work on for the next event i want to talk to ian ahead of time and what I'll do is, uh, you know, what it'll help us advertise. I'll put out branded X cards, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, and you know, we're have them out there, and we are strong supporters of the X card. And yeah, uh, yeah it's it's a little unfortunate, perhaps, to be be dealing with an event that uh, that doesn't have them. No, it didn't. It's not that they weren't supported. It wasn't no, no. like they were there saying but not no, everyone. We think it's dumb, dumb. No, no, but but not everyone used them. And I think yeah. we're at a point now where that's just not okay anymore. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, to be if the X card was there, I would have done something against Holly because I know that safety mechanics there that she could have tapped it, and I would have been all right. And then I probably would have said, "Why are you playing paranoia?" But right. <laughs> still, no. Yep. All right. And now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate your their support. Welcome, David Miller Jr., our latest Patreon patron. Roger Lynn Scott Jr., thank you. We are collecting all the juniors. Brian Kurtz, thanks. Uh, Yuho Rutila, thank you. Duran Barnett, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end. I'm going to head home soon, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. So the doors to the lobby are closed. You can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. You can catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30, or mostly play Gloomhaven, but now and then we'll surprise you with something else, or Nurgle will strike, and there won't be any game. 
Yes, that's unfortunately we had nothing last Thursday. I apologize for that. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Be sure to stick around after and join us in the penthouse suite for an Off the Books After Show. And our new tradition of rating another tabletop gaming Twitch streamer at the end of the night. For Tabletop Bellhop Games, I'm Sean. I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.